Okay, we were uh, sent a list of questions uh, that uh, that several of the folks who attended our university lecture series lecture uh, posed uh, during that lecture, and and we've been asked to take a little bit of time uh, to to answer these questions. So uh, and we're not capable of taking a little bit of time to do anything. Yeah, so that's probably true. Might, so might end up taking a lot of time. Yeah, so it, it, if you have about an hour and a half, kick back, uh, relax, and, uh, and we'll take a swing at this. Um, I, I, I will say we condensed a lot of the questions because there were a lot of them, and as you would guess, some of them ask similar kinds of things. So, uh, so you might not hear the exact phrase of your question, but believe me, all the questions that people are asked are, are in here somewhere. So uh, we're happy you joined us, if you've joined us, all six of you for this little video. And uh, so here we here we go. So the first question, and I'll read the question and then Art can kick it off here. Uh, again, this is sort of a synthesized question from several people. And they ask, is there a correlation between stress and how well you're doing in school? When does a fixation on academic performance start to become a hindrance to mental health? Yeah, and I wanna start this off by pointing out that this gives us an opportunity to teach you all about one of the oldest findings in the field of psychology, which is something called the Yerkes-Dodson curve, named after two guys, and they were guys, uh, because, it was, because it was 114 years ago. So back in 1908, yes, that's right, 1908, that it was not a typo in my speech, uh, <laughs> two gentlemen named Yerkes and Dodson uh, laid out a relationship between the amount of mental energy that you have and your performance. And, and, and that, that curve is, a, is an inverted U. So take the letter U, turn it upside down, and what you get is if you're not really, really energized, you don't get much done. As you get more and more energized for a while, you start getting more and more done, working more and more effectively, after which you slip over the edge of the Yerkes-Dodson curve and the additional energy you get leads to worse performance. Yeah. Now think about stress for a moment. If you're moderately stressed about some upcoming assignment, that, that stress can actually create some energy that might actually get you to work on a project and begin to work on it effectively. And so a little bit of stress can, can actually be a good thing. It's not the case that, that stress is always bad. A little bit of stress can be good, but if you get very, very stressed out about something, then you end up panicking and you're not concentrating very well, and you end up pacing around and, and not really thinking very clearly, and your, your, your working memory capacity, which is the amount of, of information you can hold in mind, actually begins to narrow down in ways that don't help you to think clearly or critically. So, so you, you wanna hit that sweet spot. If you find like that you've got just enough energy to feel like you can really work well, then then that's a good amount of energy. And if stress is contributing some of that energy, that's okay. But if you find yourself really debilitated by it, because it's just, you're just, you're so worried and anxious about what's going on, then, you know, that that's too much stress. You really need to work on some of those stress reduction techniques. Yeah, and, and one important thing to think about as an indicator of what kind of stress you've got, whether you've got the energizing stress or the debilitating stress, is what you do in response to the feeling of being stressed, right? Uh, because what happens a lot of times when you're stressed and you're on that right side of the yerkes dodson curve is you just engage in a lot of avoidance behavior, right? And so by the way, the right side means the incorrect side. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right, thank on you. On the right, yes. Yes. but not the correct side. It's yeah, side exactly. That you've got too much energy. Exactly. The, we, we might say, if, if you're a geography major, the easterly side of the, <laughs> uh, of the York and Johnson curve. So anyway, so, so if you're over there and, and you find yourself, I'm so stressed about this, I'm going to go take a walk with my friends or I'm going to go watch a video or I'm going to go do something else, that's a really good indicator that you're overly stressed. And one of the things that's sort of fascinating and maybe paradoxical about this, but maybe not, is that when you feel that little bit of stress, a little bit of energized, and what you do in response to it is you get a little bit of work done. Often, that has several positive effects. Not only do you have a little bit more work done, but also it reduces the stress because now you've actually done something productive. And I think if there's one thing to take away from this question, it's how much setting up small goals that are frequently achievable is a way 
to make yourself feel like you're being productive and not overly stressed. I mean, a lot of classes that you take probably have some big assignments, you know, like a paper that turns into the end of the semester, or you have a midterm that counts some big percentage of your grade. And rather than thinking about those things as these monolithic, huge things looming in front of you, if you break those up into smaller pieces, what the accomplishment of those small chunks does is it reduces stress and gives you a little positive jolt because you're actually getting getting things done. Awesome. Here, I'll read okay. the next one. I okay. want to Great. share yeah. the load here. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Art. Here's question number two. If you know that you if you know that if you work hard enough or put enough time and dedication into a class that you can make the highest grade you're capable of in it, how do you decide what where your boundaries are? How much time is too much time? And, and how do you find that boundary for each class? That's a, that's a great question and, and or set of questions. And, and one thing to think about is this isn't the same for everybody, right? I mean, some of you who were at the lecture last week and some of you who are watching this now, uh, as I said, all six of you, uh, sometimes when you, you, you think about engaging in some thing at school, you think, I need to get the highest grade I can possibly get. And I, we understand that. I mean, it, it, we were students too, even though it was a very long time ago. But, uh, you know, we, we understand that idea, like you feel like you need to be doing the most work all the time. But I think it's worth sitting down and taking a moment to look at the things that you have to do in a given semester and the classes you're enrolled in in a given semester and say, what are my goals for each of these classes? And recognize that all of those classes are probably not equally important to you in terms of your personal interest and your future aspirations and that kind of thing. And, and, and also some of them may require more effort and more time from you than other classes. And so now that gives you an opportunity to think, okay, so how do I want to apportion my time in a week? And rather than waiting until things that are due on Friday kind of bubble up and now it's Thursday and I'm in a panic, how can I start maybe... You know, Monday, chip away at a little of this thing that's due on Friday and then do something else. And then thinking about, and if I get, you know, whatever grade I'm shooting for on this thing, then I'm good with that, even though it's not the highest grade. And I'll add one more thing to that, too. You should evaluate yourself in relationship to your work and not in relationship to your classmates. Because one of the things that happens to all of us as human beings, we, we naturally, I hate, hesitate to use that word, but we, we compare ourselves to other people. And when we see somebody else doing better, it often leads us to think that we're not good at this because we're not, good at as, we're not as good as that person. That's a mistake, right? Evaluate your performance based on your goals and what you're trying to accomplish and not on other people in the class. Yeah, yeah. And, and I would say too, Put, put all of this in the context of, your, of the whole life you want to lead. So, so remember, yeah. uh, your classes are um, an important part of your reason for being here, but it, they're not the only reason that you're here. You have other activities you may want to engage in. You might be in, in various in, in clubs or social groups, and, and that also matters. Yeah. So, so, you know, now you may not get as much time with your friends or for your activities in certain weeks of a semester because there's three midterms and a paper due and, you know, some, sometimes something's got to give. But, but you definitely want to make sure that if you're in a normal week that you are able to achieve the variety of goals you have. If you, if yeah. you hope to get some exercise, if you haven't found time to get exercise, you need to clear some space in your time, in your calendar to get that exercise. Yeah. And, and so, uh, you know, I think you have to, you want to put this into the context of that whole life. And then, and then just because I got, I always feel like I got to teach stuff. Uh, the, that, that, that tendency we have to compare ourselves to each other, psychologists call that social comparison. And when you compare yourself to somebody better off than you are or who's doing better than you are, you're making an upward social comparison. And the problem with those upward social comparisons is they're going to make you feel bad. And you only want to make those upward social comparisons if it's going to be motivating to you. You look at somebody who's a little bit better at you than something and you think I could be that person and it's motivating to try to do that, then, then those kinds of comparisons can be good. But if you make that upward social comparison and you think to yourself, I'll never be as good as that person no matter what I do, that can actually be de 
energizing, demotivating. And in that case, you know, lay off the social comparison and just focus on being a better version of you next week than you were this week. Yeah. And, you know, all of you, I'm sure, were, were fairly successful or even very successful in high school. You know, you might have been the very top of your class. And, and all of you who are Texans, you know, are probably in the upper 6% of your class. So that's a distinguishing feature of all of you. Well, you know, I mean, everybody here is that. So I think to, to think that you've got to always be in that part of the distribution is a mistake. And it set yourself, it, it set yourself up to be unhappy because you're not going to be sometimes in the top whatever percent you think you should be in. And I think, again, rather than making, as Art's saying, those social comparisons that are saying, well, I'm never going to be as good as that person, in some cases, that doesn't mean you should stop doing that. It just means, look at that person. They're really good. I'm not going to be as good as that person, but I really enjoy this, and I'm learning something. Great. And if you haven't thought about that before, it's, it's, worth, a, it's worth a think. Okay, I'm going to read the next uh, question since we decided to alternate on, on these things. So the next question is, again, are, these are synthesized questions. How do I differentiate being unhappy with my environment and with my actual situation? Because I don't necessarily want to do work for school, but I enjoy the subject and the practical work of it, but not the school work. And I find it hard to find I find it hard to find people in my major who I can truly enjoy being around. Yeah, and, and I will say, I mean, most of you are are just starting college. So you're a few weeks in and uh, you may not have found your people yet and you may not have hit your stride yet. And uh, that's completely natural and normal. It takes a while to figure out who am I, let alone who do I want to hang out with and what do I want to do? And so, uh, you know, there, there is that old phrase, right? Fake it till you make it. And, and there's something to be said for that. I, there's something Bob talks about a lot, so I'm going to steal this from him, is that Absolutely. a lot of times, a lot of times we feel like um, I can't really authentically do my work until I feel like I should be doing my work. And yeah, sometimes that's true, but most of the time you can actually uh, create the desired motivation and the desired behavior from the outside in. Do the work yeah. and then discover, oh, actually some of this I enjoy. And, and I am motivated to do this. And so, and so I, I think that one way to approach this is to say, okay, I know that here are some things I need to do. For now, I'm just gonna do them because I know it's the right thing to do, even if I'm not really feeling it at the moment. And in the meantime, I'm gonna engage broadly with my peers. Yeah. And I may discover that there are folks in my major that, 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 that are part of my group I might not. I might discover that most of the people who, who I meet in my classes are not really my people, even though I might like some of the, the subject matter, and I'm going to find my people somewhere else. And that's okay too, right? It's, yeah. it's okay to have a bit of a separation between the, the, the academic topics that you're, that you're focused on and the people you're closest to. And, and that, that can be perfectly fine. But I think the main thing is, particularly this early on in, in a first semester of college, do put you know do your work put yourself in situations where you're going to meet people and then allow things to happen and and see how that plays out yeah you know i one i think misconception that people have about finding their place in the world is that when they find the right place everything's going to click right away you know i mean i i i, I really dislike the phrase when people say find your passion as if your passion is out there somewhere fully formed. And as soon as you find it, yeah, as soon as you find it, everything's going to click. You think, my God, I'm home. This is my thing. You know, that, that almost never happens. It happens sometimes, but not a lot. And really what develops enthusiasm and passion and interest in an idea or the people associated with an idea is you're investing in it yourself investing your time, investing your effort and energies. And I think an important thing that Art was saying about interacting with people, you know, I, you know, everything's not going to click right away. And so you might spend some time with people and ask them some questions about themselves and try to understand them a little bit more and what they're into and why they're different from you and that kind of thing. And, and also, I think, you know, for, for, for liking the subject matter, 
and then you get here and you think, wait, I still like the subject matter, but I don't like this work that I have to do. I think a lot of people's conceptions of what the subject matter is when they're an amateur changes when you try to become a professional in the subject matter, right? Because you think, oh, really? It, it's this? You know, I mean, I, I, I think a lot of people, <laughs> I had a classmate once when I was in high school who really wanted to be a doctor uh, until he realized he, he really didn't like the sight of blood. You know, which is a hindrance if you're going to be a physician. So, so I think, you know, the 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 idea of imagining what it's like to be a whatever a physicist, a physician, a historian, or whatever, you know, when that smacks up against the reality of this is the stuff you do to become that. Uh, a lot of people are initially put off by that, but I'm going to emphasize something that Art said, which is I think the most important he said, is give it time. Don't decide too quickly. Uh, we, we human beings, we get closure really fast. We, we want to make up our minds really fast. Am I in the right place? Yes. Am I in the right place? No, I'm out of here. You know, let time pass. I mean, it's only the fifth week of the semester. More stuff's going to unfold as the semester goes on. And I always suggest to people, set a time in the future when you're going to rethink where you are. You know, and, and it's not going to be now, right? So not every day you think, am I in the right place? Am I in the right place? Like every day? You say, okay, I'm going to wait until January 7th, I don't know, whatever day. And say, and then I'm going to sit back and think, okay, so I'm just looking back on fall semester. Should I stay in this major or should I do some, something else? And let that time pass, not only through the semester, but then being away from the university for a little bit and letting that percolate a little bit. That's a, that's a huge, yeah. huge thing. And just one other quick thing too is, you know, bear in mind that 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 you know you're at the front end of a of a uh, of your college career, and you you shouldn't necessarily hold yourself to decisions you made before you even got to college. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, and and the fact is that it's hard enough that that you know over the next four years or between the ages of eighteen and twenty two, roughly, you are going to make a series of decisions that are going to influence the first part of your career, if not your whole career, which means that that much of, of the neck of, of the next several decades of your life are going to be influenced by decisions that you're making, uh, you know, in these next four years. And, 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 and I don't mean to scare you with that, but I think the thing that's important to bear in mind is is that you don't want to, to hold yourself to, to decisions you made before you even got here. Yeah. And then allow that to have some profound influence on on what happens for uh, for a significant chunk of time afterwards. So be willing to, uh, again, as Bob was saying, set a date, maybe the end of the semester or, the, or right after the new year and spend some serious time saying, how do I feel about how things are going so far? Are there changes I'd like to make? Would I like to explore other options? Mm -hmm. Be open to that. Uh, be open to that exploration, but just don't be open to it every day. Yeah, right, right. And and, and clearly, my dog Charlie Parker agrees with you. He's, excuse, yeah. excuse me, just a minute, Mark. So uh, as soon as that car, as soon as yeah. that car leaves, he'll he'll he'll. Well, I I just want everyone who's listening to to bear in mind that. That, that Charlie Parker amazingly is able to bark with a little swing. Oh, nicely put. It's really, it's yeah, really he's just funny. he's just bopping along. He's just I know, bopping it's along. Amazing. <laughs> uh, so so anyhow, uh, uh, apparently you Can know you most people. Oh, well, Am yeah, I reading or you? But I, but I just I just got a. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Charlie, no, no, Charlie I'm, broke I'm, our flow I'm here. Saying, <laughs> I'm saying that, that that most people feel that they don't they don't understand. Uh, the barking of dogs and apparently we have to we have to recognize that it 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 don't mean a thing if it oh wow uh, okay okay <laughs> sorry okay um here's the next question i'm we'll fix it in post <laughs> <laughs> i'm an education major with the goal of making significant changes to the way school is done my question is how can we create a classroom environment that sustains joy, curiosity, and an eagerness to learn? What a lovely goal. I, I hope every classroom environment sustains joy, curiosity, and eagerness to learn. And I, I got to tell you, you know, what happens a lot in school is decided by teachers and how they set up the syllabus and what the daily activities are and that kind of thing. 
But I'm going to sort of shift your question around a little bit first, and then I'll get to the actual question. Because I'm going to say, how can everybody involved create a classroom environment that sustains joy, curiosity, and eagerness to learn, including students? Because I think if you leave that responsibility solely to the teacher, I mean, I got to tell you, we, we have lovely colleagues on this campus. You're going to have wonderful teachers in your time here at UT, but occasionally you're going to have a class you're going to think, this is a really boring class, I don't really like this class. But And so you could either say, well, only 14 more weeks to go, which is a hell of a way to respond to that. Or you can ask yourself the question, what can I do myself? What can I can control that will make this more interesting to me? And, and here's the thing, the more actively you participate in the activities of the class, not only, you know, in stuff you're doing outside of class and studying and that kind of thing, but in class, I mean, like asking questions, asking things that may not be the main topic of what's going on, but something that might be interest, interesting to you. And I think many teachers who say any questions and then wait are truly disappointed when everybody just sits there staring at them or staring at their laptop and doesn't ask a question. So one way as a student to create more joy and curiosity and eagerness to learn when someone says any questions, ask a question. And in fact, talk to some group of your classmates and get a little cabal together and all of you ask questions, right? And even sometimes when the professor doesn't prompt a question, say, well, you know, we have some questions. We, we like to ask some questions. That will help do that. Now, as far as be, when you're in control and you're the teacher, here's a secret to making that work. Everybody appreciates being able to see goals that are clear to them, that require an, a, an amount of effort that I'm able and willing to put forward. And then I'm reasonably confident that if I do that, I'll accomplish the goal. So one of the things to ask yourself as a teacher, when you're thinking about whatever the subject is that you're teaching, and Art and I, when we talk to our colleagues about designing classes, which we do from time to time, we say this all the time, and some of them actually listen to us, is you know how do you structure the syllabus so instead of having a few huge things that matter a lot as contributing to your grade, you have little things that you're doing all the time that keep your mind engaged, keep asking questions, it keeps you thinking about and having to generate things on your own. And that activity of generating things on your own frequently is something that increases curiosity. And if you're generating things on your own that often lead to increasing your understanding, it's more joyful. And now you're more eager to learn the next thing because that thing came about in a positive way. Yeah. So that's my long-winded short answer to that question. Art, maybe I have something which to is, add. Which is a great question. I'm so I'm just gonna, I, Great answer. And I'm just going to add one piece to this too, which is, an oddity of the education environment is that you spend most of your time learning something that the person teaching you uh, that information already knows. And as a result, you end up answering lots of questions that the person asking the question already knows the answer to, and you know that. Which is weird, right? Because, because we don't do that anywhere else in our lives. Yeah. Right? So, so nobody, nobody walks up to you, as I like to say, nobody walks up to you on the street and says, hey, what time is it? And you say, it's 1137, and they say, that's exactly right. Because that would be weird, right? I mean, you, you know, we, we generally speaking ask questions of somebody else because we'd like to know the answer to it. And so one of the ways to, to, to try to reorient the way students are thinking about their learning is to have them develop questions and ask each other questions that, that the person asking the question really wants to know the answer to so that you can then create an environment in which people are exploring the answers to questions that they have generated for themselves that yeah. they're interested yeah. in getting the answer to as opposed to i asked you a question you know i know the answer already and now i've got to find a way to give you the answer that you know already in an acceptable form and yeah. that that just is not as exciting yeah exactly exactly okay so i we don't want to take up uh too much of your life uh, with these things. So, so there's one more question which I insisted uh, that we include in that, and that was somebody asked Art, "How hard was it learning to play the saxophone?" And and I, I love that question, and I think I think the answer is is well, one answer to that is <laughs> not hard in the sense that that I, I I chose to do it, I wanted to do it, I was excited about doing it, and while there were definite frustrations along the way, it was it was a lot of joy. Uh, across the process. But I, I will say two things, one of which is 
Um, it's a little bit like that old board game Othello, where the tagline was a moment to learn and a lifetime to master. Um, you know, I, I was able to get a sound out, although it did sound like moving chairs in the kitchen, as I as I mentioned earlier in the in the talk uh, early on. But I, you know, within a within a month or two, I had something that sounded vaguely like a saxophone. Still, it took you know a decade to to feel like I I wanted to go out and play with other musicians. But but I will say that that one of the the most challenging things, particularly as an adult coming to this was was being willing to learn the basics. So so I wanted to learn to improvise. But but early on I resisted playing scales because I had memories of playing scales as a in, on the piano as a kid and 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 my teachers never explained to me why I was learning to play scales. They just made me do it and it was horrible and it was boring. So I resisted it and my teacher thankfully um, was willing to let me get away with that for a while, figuring I would discover on my own why I needed to learn scales, which is, which is that at some point you get a, a, you know, a, a piece of music with a bunch of chords written on it that are the chord progressions to a song, and you are expected somehow to improvise over that. And the only way to learn to do that is to know the variety of scales that might be compatible with the particular piece of music you're playing, at which point you realize I'd better learn my darn scales and yeah. I better learn them well enough that I don't have to think about them in the midst of, uh, of, of trying to play this song, at which point you buckle down and start playing them and you do it with joy because you realize what, what learning those scales is actually gonna open up for you. So, um, so there were some moments like that where I had to overcome my own biases about, about what I needed to learn and when. Um, but but it, it was it was truly a a life changing experience to go ahead and do that. And I, I recommend throughout your life finding those things that you just want to know how to do and then and then just just throw yourself into them. Yeah. And, and I'll just add one one thing to what Art is saying about the willingness uh, to fumble for a while, you know, and to have to just do this, the not so beautiful stuff. Because that's what you have to do to get to the beautiful stuff is you have to go through that thing. And I think what many people do when they take up something new is they have an unrealistic expectation of how quickly it's going to feel good and easy, right? So back when we were talking about, about classes, how can you set little goals for yourself that bring you joy because you accomplish that goal, you know? Uh, especially learning something as sort of, amorphous as improvising, you know, because you're making stuff up and you can choose what notes to play and all that. I mean, th there's a lot of things to go into that. And so to be able to set things up in a way that you have little successes along the way that you can feel good about, recognizing that you still have a long way to go. But learning all of this is a joy because you can see yourself learning new things, right? And, and once you start to put that front and center, like that's what happened today. Look, I yesterday I couldn't do this little thing and now I can do this little thing and I'm really happy about that. Even though I'm not done, like I'm far from done, uh, it changes the way you think about learning and changes the way you think about your place in the world. Yeah. All right. Well, we've, uh, we've, we've eaten up uh, 45 minutes of your time and uh, we hope <laughs> uh, all of you who chose to watch this or were forced to watch this or whatever have gotten something out of it so for uh art and me and charlie parker who made an appearance uh today uh we wish you all again as we said last week have a great semester and uh and best of luck and we hope we'll run into you on campus all right yeah. take care